morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back for our last day of uh, traditional golf architecture week. Uh, for those who I've not met yet, I'm uh, James Onley. I'm the Director of Historical Research and Partnerships here at the Gutter National Library. And it is my uh, job and privilege to oversee uh, a number of fantastic uh, research initiatives here, uh, all of which will eventually see life uh, on the Gutter Digital Library. Our most famous project to date is the British Library project to digitize millions of pages uh, of historical records and photographs and maps relating to the history and heritage of Gutter and its region. And this conference is about another project to create a digital collection relating to uh, the traditional architecture of Gutter and its region uh, from 1700s or even earlier uh, up to the um, mid 20th century to uh, uh, identify um, private, for the most part, collections uh, held in the homes of architects or former architects uh, or the heirs of architects, uh, archaeologists, historians, anthropologists, former expats, uh, as well as government institutions or archives, um, and to digitize this material, which is uh, spread across the world, uh, and bring it all together into a single interface on the Gutter Digital Library. Uh, and through this uh, wonderful collection of photographs of traditional buildings, architectural drawings, architectural maps, field notes, uh, interviews, uh, publications, all available free online, uh, we will uh, be able to tell the story of the history of this country and its region in a new way a new social, cultural, and economic history. We've already seen some illustrations of this, looking at the, for example, influences uh, on uh, architecture in Eastern Arabia from farther afield. And along with that will come the history of trade, uh, migration flows, cultural connections, uh, and so on. And in this way, we can see that, in fact, uh, Gutter has a very dynamic and fascinating history. And uh, we hope to fill in many blanks and shed new light on uh, the past of this region. So um, I'm going to invite in turn uh, each member of our, our core team uh, to stand up and to summarize a few of the points and things that they've uh, um, um, learned from this conference. The purpose of this conference was to uh, draw attention to the project uh, and to um, uh, provide an opportunity for people to come forward and uh, be involved, either because they have material that they would like to have digitized and contribute to this collection, or they would like to provide, uh, 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 not, they would like to uh, provide research content, or to write articles or encyclopedia entries for the online encyclopedia that will be accompanying this, uh, or book chapters for the publications. Uh, that the team will be putting together and publishing by uh, QNL Press in cooperation with Liverpool University Press, or because they would like to uh, support the project, or because they would like to use what the project has to offer. And the project will have a lot to offer uh, uh, a broad range of people, from uh, private practice to uh, government to museums, tourism authority to researchers and the general public, and schools and universities as well. So. One thing I've learned is that um, architecture really is a broad tent uh, under which we can put a number of categories. Uh, and it, it, it's a new lens uh, through which to view um, the, the, the region's past and its heritage and the ongoing debate about the authentic and, and uh, identity itself, what it means to be uh, from this part of the world or from gutter. Um, <clears throat> we've also um, uh, identified a number of potential collections, uh, Meshara Museums, Gutter Museums, uh, I think the Ministry of uh, Municipality uh, and possibly Gutter University uh, have uh, come forward identifying some collections uh, that we could uh, hopefully uh, digitize and include uh, if they haven't been digitized, and include in this, in this collection. So this is an opportunity to 
uh, summarize everything and for people in the audience to say, yes, I have something to contribute and we'll write all this down. But the most important person to tell uh, uh, here is uh, Professor Showman from Liverpool who will be uh, leading the project. So without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, Showman to come up and, and say a few words and to uh, um, gather as much information as he can from you. This is a great opportunity to make your suggestions. Then I will uh, ask Ibrahim Jada, then Nader Arderland, and then finally uh, the head of architecture at Qatar University, uh, Fadl Fadli. Thank you, James. Um, thank you very much and thank you everyone for this fantastic opportunity at Qatar National Library, um, Ibrahim Jeda, uh, the Qatar uh, the University. Uh, everyone concerned, it's been a really fantastic stay and this has been my first visit to Qatar and having done that, I am absolutely certain that you know, this will uh, occur on a you know, high frequency you know, here on. Um, I think uh, these five, four, five days have been really useful in terms of um, uh, really getting uh, our minds working towards how might we do this uh, best, uh, how might we be able to collect and also make sense of that material because um, collection is one thing and uh, I certainly think that it is absolutely crucial that we collect um, and uh, document and digitize all the material that there is. At the same time I think um, one of the things I realize very strongly and with my work in, in Oman, certainly I know that how important it is to make sense of that uh, through rigorous research. And the research can only happen when we are pulling these various layers of understanding together, the social, cultural, um, economic, um, you know, you name it, there are many, many things. At the end of the day, if we're thinking architecture, that's, and this is my personal sort of standpoint, I'm not uh, asking everyone to con uh, c conform to that, but it is about space. It's about understanding uh, nature of space, meaning of space, and understanding how space is constructed and uh, through mainly human activities and performance. And that is, that is where I think we can begin to distinguish this effort from any other say broadly social, cultural, historical efforts that inevitably will come into it. But at the end of the day, what we are standing for here is um, space at different levels of operation, from a operation of a landscape to a settlement to a building and civic space and so on. And if we can focus on that kind of study, uh, then I think we have made a big difference to the study of uh, Middle East, um, uh, certainly, uh, but if not, you know, wider parts of the world, because certainly that is our focus. And I often ask myself how I deal with architectural history, but I also ask myself how am I different from another historian um, of architecture? And that's the, that's the difference, and I feel that it is to do with space, it's to do with spatial performance, it's to do with human activities within that. That's what makes space uh, meaningful. So, I, again, I would like to use this precious time that we have to listen to everyone uh, more and to note down what we can note down. Um, we have uh, obviously various pledges and so on, and I, I was going to say that uh, it, is, it will be very good, again, if we can f kind of focus back on um, how to collect, what to collect, how to categorize that collection, what are the kind of key areas where we should put our thrust in. We're finding new areas as well. For example, yesterday, the discussion on the, the kind of the development of le legal uh, um, st structures and policies, I think was very interesting because that is an area where, and I know certainly working with one of my PhD students in Saudi Arabia, um, that the the legal structures and the, the, then the application of those legal structures through um, organizational development and so on is a really interesting and important area which can stand between the implementation eventually and uh, you know, what our research is going to bring out. So I certainly think that there is um, uh, the kind of the background documentation of all of that and how it evolved and so on could be a really interesting area of uh, understanding that uh, as yet we were not uh, paying attention to. Um, so going back to those kind of key areas that I feel is our ambition to digitize, our ambition to undertake high quality research, 
and our ambition to disseminate at all possible levels. Um, it is crucial that we push uh, our understanding. We don't retain it within the realms of this this aircraft hangar, you know. But more than that, we go beyond that to talk about uh, um, to talk to different groups of people, uh, people on the street, and so on. That's the only way which we will actually see the kind of significance of this um, project coming out. We have to talk about. Where are the bibliographies? Can we actually pick up the bibliographies? We have to talk about, uh, as James has already indicated, that there are already pledges of various collections. Uh, we haven't heard probably much from other parts of the Gulf region, which we need to do in terms of in essentially the kind of interconnected nature of this relationship, which we have been finding out. We probably need to also understand uh, where does the the, the kind of uh, the research realm stop. Uh, do we actually also connect up with Iran, with uh, Pakistan, with India? What are the connect connectivities that we would focus on? And what are the kind of priorities and what are the uh, less important ones? Also another important thing that came out was what's the, f the geographical remit of the Gulf? You know, um, and I think uh, there was a discussion about whether it's about, uh, say, 50 or 100 kilometers from the coast inwards. Um, they will have many, many definitions. And how do we structure that understanding so that we can get a better um, collection of material and a meaningful collection of material, too? Um, I think I will, uh, therefore, leave it. I will only emphasize the urgency of this project because so much material is getting lost. So much material is not being made sense of. Um, it's lying in all kinds of locations. But also, we are not, uh, as academics, uh, putting enough attention to the value of that material. Uh, I think so. Therefore, this is incredibly timely, but also um, something that we are catching up with. So it is crucial that we. Um, start the work now and sort of spread the word around that it is happening and it is going to pull together an enormous amount of material. So I'll, I'll stop there. I think I, I will again like to thank everyone who has contributed to this these four days, five days, and it's been a really incredible learning experience for all of us. I think uh, it will be fantastic to carry on this discussion now in a focused manner so that we can begin to identify the key issues that we will now like to take home. What we will also try to do on behalf of the Liverpool University is to set up a base, uh, a database where we can begin to store that material, uh, acknowledging everyone's contribution in the right manner in each and every case, so that it is um, uh, a repository that we can begin to pull together, uh, pending you know, the, the final decisions on projects and so on, but we can begin the work in urgency now. Okay, so thank you very much. Good morning. Again, I would like to thank you, James, and thank the Qatar National Library for this uh, amazing uh, effort to put together a, a dream that we all that were interested in the local vernacular uh, architecture into reality. And I hope this reality starts evolving fast as there is so much in the agenda when we are quite behind to start that. What, I mean, I started digging the surface in the 80s when I came back from the States and realized as I saw these buildings being knocked out, uh, how important they were to us. And uh, as a result of this research that we're going to see, what do I hope to come up with? And I think after you start documenting all this data, we will open the ground for the younger generations to start analyzing millions of things. Let's say now, as I compare, and I think it should be the wider gulf for sure, because with that, we'll see the different type of influences, as much as this style of architecture looks similar to the first timer. But I have noticed that there are differences uh, depending on who were the masons, what are the topography, uh, even though the Gulf is small, but some prevailing wind and humidity varies from one place to other. And uh, the masons' capabilities, the population. And imagine if I have this data and I start comparing with why don't, doesn't Qatar have a wind tower? 
Is it our environment or the masons that came to build or our construction capabilities? Not only that, you start also realizing from some of the aerial photographs how people started moving and when did they start moving. And you would notice that the building of the forts started disappearing as soon as the nation was formed and the treaty with the British has order was established and the tribes stopped attacking each other because there was order and the, the construction of the force has been suspended. We will, I think we will go way beyond the architecture, was, which is really thrilling. But as we start digging with this, we'll realize the movement, the influences, the traveling. Uh, and then on top of all of that, lessons to be learned of this gorgeous construction. I mean, to have Liverpool and the studies that the gentlemen uh, that showed us how you analyzed what is happening in Oman and the, to realize that masjids with no mihrabs and, and the method of construction and no minarets and all of this will have so many answers uh, and questions to be raised. But uh, being an architect and a practitioner and what I hope again for our younger generation as, as all of this will be available, that they will have a treasure of these gorgeous seeds that from it we can learn so much not only about our history, but how should we form our future and especially our architecture in the future. Just by analyzing the orientation, the sizes, the methods, uh, how did our ancestors adapt to this harsh environment and put this to a basic formula that we can design our newer buildings, putting just the environmental aspects into it, regardless of the aesthetical, I think the results will be incredible. So this is really a wonderful opportunity. And I'm hoping as we progress in this, maybe a year from now, that we shouldn't also, I, I know we're taking it a little bit beyond the dates that uh, the, where we end this in the 50s or the 40s uh, construction, but I think early 50s, 60s, there was an early modern movement. When it started, the same old mason, El Bennai, was building. So you see in new modern material, as in block and cement, but still you see the lewan, you see the courtyard. That transition was very sensitive to the environment until we started getting different ideas of the villas and the boxes. So I think it's worthwhile documenting our early modern history because as we speak, they are being knocked out. And until we raise the flag, that's thank God. Uh, and uh, Sheikh Al Mayasa has really done a good effort to protect some of the older schools, some of the ministries, and that are now have been the firehouse that has been renovated. So we are beginning to realize our modern history is important. And hopefully, the title listed buildings is going to become to force and becomes a law. So this is really exciting, and I really thank, and uh, I offer all the time, and as soon as Shala Riverpool gets appointed, I don't mind to come and workshops there, assist at, with my pleasure and with joy, because this is definitely much more fun than sitting and doing paperwork in the office. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And I think certainly we all echo the uh, applause to James and to Schumann for the program of uh, traditional golf architecture that you have uh, introduced. And really, it's much larger than this. Uh, for some years, many of us, led very much here in Qatar by, uh, by Abraham, we have started to look at pieces of this great puzzle uh, called uh, golf society and built environment. Uh, it's now really uh, wonderful that Qatar has taken the uh, lead. I think that you're going to be developing the pivotal archival digital open source knowledge base for the entire Gulf. Uh, this is your mandate. This is where you're going. And uh, regardless of uh, any hindrance from anything temporary, 
this is the place that this uh, knowledge base needs to be. It needs to be open source. It needs to be monitored. And so I'm thrilled to give my support, as small as it is, but with the depth of my heart and all the years that I've worked toward that aim. So I'm very happy to find that this is happening. Uh, I want to just uh, say a couple of things that I learned that we've discussed. And I hope that uh, th this comes true. Uh, first, first of all, uh, the thematic look. In many ways, this word traditional has its benefits. It also has its drawbacks. Because people look at this word traditional as being something of the past, and uh, everybody is thrilled about moving toward the unknown future. So I want to just suggest that perhaps at some point you reconsider and use the word perennial, or words that deal with eternally spring light blossoming, eternally valid. Because uh, in that way, you overcome this comment that, oh, you're just looking back. And that's too trite. You want to be far beyond that. And so I would just suggest, very important, if you would consider uh, dealing with this as some valid, common core, uh, homo spe uh, uh, sapien, golf-based thematic approach. Also, I hope that this idea of a holistic sustainability that is both looking at the phenomenal aspects of our uh, built heritage and also at the uh, intangible aspects uh, be the real focus and that uh, uh, the word sustainability or durability is into the bones of this research because this is what we desperately need. And in that way, uh, it again takes a look not only in what we have been doing, but it helps us to understand uh, some of the vulnerabilities of today and perhaps gives us the courage to have the visions about how we handle the future. And the future is tomorrow. I mean, to present is happening at every instant of our existence. So the vision is how you take the next steps. So just to uh, summarize, I, I'm deeply thrilled that uh, you're, you're thinking of something that is covering the environmental, public health aspects, something that deals with the, the whole region, uh, water, earth, air, and that there is obviously the addition to the normal social economic, this key aspect of culture. Because without that, I think that uh, it's just reduced to the measurable aspects but it's the culture that gives it this in intangibility, and it gives it, I think, its beauty and its spirit. And uh, finally, it is really focusing on the urban and architecture. It, it is the whole settlement. So perhaps the scale that it goes from region to uh, cities to neighborhoods to buildings so that we might agree on the scale of what is being studied. Uh, that, that would also now in some ways help uh, unify a lot of the pieces that I see we're all working on. I mean, the Harvard work was structured in these three scales. Uh, I know that some of the work that uh, Rob Carter is working on seems to be, again, at this urban and then moving to the unit. I know the kind of presentations that uh, Schumann has made so brilliantly on Oman. And uh, I, I think if 
the lead is to the depth of what Schumann has been showing us about what he's been doing on, on his own personal direction of research in Oman, you, you couldn't ask for a better leader in this work. Um, I'm just going to summarize quickly what I think uh, I remember from the fact that we went to all the eight countries around the Gulf, and I hope you do all the eight countries, for God's sake. Uh, I mean, where would uh, the Gulf be without the Tigris, Euphrates, uh, Mesopotamian uh, civilization? This was the cradle of civilization. How can you do the Gulf without beginning with the baby? Uh, so uh, uh, that, unfortunately, right now, because of the enormous strife that uh, Iraq, Basra has gone through, and when I visited that, uh, I was uh, really saddened. I cried at what I saw. Destroyed, destroyed. A civilization there destroyed, and everything just beginning uh, to take shape. Uh, wonderful university beginning, but just beginning. And so I, I definitely hope that Basra University uh, is one of your keys. And there are a lot of people who are in sort of the NGO aspects. There's a lot of there's a lot of people from Iraq who have major uh, architectural planning companies here in the Gulf, in, in Dubai. And they were the ones that took me there. They're the ones that were interested in uh, uh, preserving what has been destroyed. So I hope that we work with the, with the, really the private Iraqi firms who have very established leading firms here in the Gulf, mainly working out of, out of Dubai. Um, I want to just say something, and already the work in Oman has so brilliantly been presented. In the UAE, really, uh, Ajidi in Abu Dhabi, I mean, it's incredible the amount of research and work that they have on the environment of uh, not only the UAE, uh, but the Gulf. And so I, I think that, in fact, when I have studied this aspect of sea rise, that I think is really a key important element for uh, anything that we do. I believe that sea rise and whatever has happened in terms of storms and surge and saltwater intrusion, uh, it isn't something that's new. Uh, everybody's been living with it for all these years. They've, they've, they've been sort of, they knew that uh, you had to plant in certain areas and avoid certain areas. I think that whole potable water aspect of uh, our Gulf cities is going to be endangered by the rise of seawater and our planting. We're going to have to, in fact, develop entire new levels of salt resistant uh, plantation and landscape. The, this is wonderful. I hope you just don't stay with built work, built buildings. Uh, we need landscape, and our landscape is going to be endangered by saltwater intrusion. Uh, I think that also uh, uh, Bukhash in Dubai has a marvelous archives, and so therefore uh, he's always made these available. Uh, Mazdar in Abu Dhabi has done an enormous amount of work. Really, I think out of any other country right now, you have to deal with Mazdar's research work with MIT on sustainable development. Uh, they, 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 they should easily be invited and, and contribute. And, and they want to be. They, 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 they feel that this is their honor and task. And in uh, Bahrain, the museum, uh, a wonderful source, always made available, and then uh, individual offices in Bahrain. My feeling in Saudi Arabia is that uh, uh, the Ministry of, uh, or the Agency of Culture and Tourism that Sheikh Sultan is leading, and their wonderful representative, uh, Mashari Al Naim, he's helped with our Harvard research work, he's published. He's in charge of this 
area of Saudi Arabia with regards to its traditions, etc. And then so many other of the professors uh, in, uh, in the various uh, wonderful universities in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I mean, if you can't work with uh, organizational, institutional, uh, work with un specific professors, they're dying to be here. They would have loved to have been here. Uh, and we communicate with them all the time. I visit them all the time. And so I think that uh, please use both formal and informal means. Uh, and uh, really it's hufuf uh, that you need to work on to, to, to learn about the tradition of Saudi Arabia. And uh, that's, that's so important. Uh, in, uh, in Iran, uh, well, I mean, today you do have a wonderful organization of culture and tourism who draws, who measures, uh, who produces fantastic books on the traditional architecture of Iran and all the various regions. Uh, again, I'm surprised that we don't have anybody here. Of course, you know, I'd love to be considered as somewhat of an ambassador from there, but uh, you know, it'd be wonderful to have had some of their people. Uh, and there's a lot of other people. There is the UN Habitat Group. As you know, UN Habitat has a regional base in uh, Tehran and Dubai. And they're, they're a group of people. They're researching, they're writing. Uh, they hold conferences uh, on this same subject. And so I think that those would be great. And so uh, let's go to uh, Nairobi and get UN Habitat to be helping with what we're doing. Uh, and I know that I saw the UNESCO representative here. Uh, so you're doing all the terrific things. This is a world undertaking you're doing. Uh, make no mistake, uh, each individual is going to push you, challenge you to reach the highest level of your potential because it represents their potential and their quest. Finally, I implore you to go all the way back to as long as we, we know about our known histories here. Don't, I don't, I cannot accept 1700 or whatever as some, no, no. I, I'd go back to, uh, you know, to the earliest times when we're using words like Dilmon and, and uh, Gilgamesh and all the mythics and et cetera that uh, Ali Abdullah was talking about. Th this is who we are. This is where we need to begin. Louis Kahn used to say, I want to know the origins of the origins. Please go back as deep as you finally can. Because it is in those original visions, in those original world views, that still lies that eternal aspect of your uniqueness here. And uh, recalling that and, and uh, restoring that and bring it into your archives, I think, uh, gives it the depth, you know, the sort of eternal depth of what your archives could hold. So I'll conclude by saying in any way that the Harvard work that we did uh, can be uh, contributive, can be used in your work. Uh, I speak really as an emeritus senior research fellow and so therefore I would have to uh, confer with my colleagues uh, on the Mesherib uh, contract with Harvard. I would definitely have to deal with Mesherib uh, with regards to the ownership of some of these documents. But uh, the, the, these are yours. You paid for it. Qatar Foundation paid for it. And so I hope that those are all made available in any way in which I can facilitate that. And I personally, as uh, an individual, who really, I mentioned to you, came here in 1964 to the Gulf, would love uh, to continue uh, my contribution uh, to the level that I can. And so I give you that as my pledge. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank James, Shoman, Ibrahim, Nader, and everybody here. It, it was really a pleasure, and I really Thank you a lot to take me out from my office where there are, I think, <laughs> Ibrahim and all administrators here uh, knows about it. I try to summarize it. I mean, it's good to be the last to speak because I think you all summarized what we talked about. However, I would like to start with something very important, and I spoke, uh, discussed it with Nader, with Shoman, with James. It's very good to study the past, to digitize the past, to record it. 
However, it will be even uh, better to use it for our present, but also for uh, our uh, children's future. So what do we learn from our past? From all this data we are recording and we will be digitizing in the database which is being developed by Liverpool School of Architecture with the help of QNL and hopefully with Qatar University, with AEB and any other institution, either in Qatar, UAE, the Gulf or worldwide. This will be very good. So what are we digitizing? What are we recording? It will be important to move to the next step once the project starts, inshallah, and analyze, compare take the positive things from it, take the negative things. We learn a lot from negative uh, and mistakes, probably more than what we have done good, what our grandparents did uh, the best of in their times, and probably we will learn from the mistakes as much as we will learn from the good lessons. And this is very important. If we will try to avoid the mistakes done in the past, correct them now, we will get the fruits very soon, tomorrow, hopefully. I have a couple of points here which I summarized over the four or five days. I missed yesterday because I was very busy. I'm sorry about it. So it is very important to know where we were, to know where we are now, and to know where we are heading to. If we look at these three stances, we will des design, develop, and build the container of these records of this data. It could be also a building, it could be a digital framework, it could be a theoretical part, but also it has to be in practice. Once we design this, we will know what we will put as a content. So the container is always linked to the content, and we will know what data will go there. I always tell my students, and I'm very happy some of them are here, those who are studying now and those who have left, they are working. It's very good to know how you design your building. It's very good how you design your strategy, uh, your framework, and to know where you will put. So we have to collect as much as we can. Then we will start filtering. We will start putting things together. We will start assembling things. We will digitize, we will categorize, we will archive. And then we will put the lessons we can learn from this and how we can use them. There are many things we can discuss, we can develop. There is the time span, and I agree both with Nader and both with Shoman. You might say I am contradicting myself. It's good to have a snapshot when you work. It's good to have a trend. Do not limit to 1700, do not limit to 1960, but it's also good to structure. You might find data related to Qatar, which spans down to 140 AD, I think, what we saw yesterday. But probably in Oman, it might trace to 2000 BC. We might find between now and the time we start the digital database, more records related to Qatar, which would just pop up doing some archeological work. And this is very important. This is not only about architecture. Architecture is the essence, probably. We need to bring all our colleagues. We have archeologists here. We have. I forgot the name, I'm very sorry, I'm getting old. <laughs> Claire. Claire. Claire, I'm really sorry, Claire. Claire was the pioneer coming to Qatar, and I am sure there will be other archaeologists coming, probably her as well, and digging and finding other sources. We have Rob here working in... One. Yes, so he's working on many projects related. And I am sure we will find and we will dig and we will find more things. Not only in Qatar, probably in Bahrain, probably in Oman. Don't forgive Jacques Tissier. He just died two months before. Okay. Before. Yeah, so as uh, Vincent said, Jacques Tissier, who recently passed away, and he did a lot of work in the region. So it is good to bring all these people together. It is good to bring our students. They are the most important how do we say, resources, potential, because through them we will reach certain things we would have never thought of. Personal, vulnerable collections are very important. We know Ibrahim, he has a collection, but there might be other people we don't know about the collection. <coughs> how do we approach them? How do we get them? I agree again with Nader, being formal, but also being informal. Let people come to us. We might forget to go to them, so we have to do it in a way to be this attractive element, to bring all the data coming to us. We have to find a way. 
There are many things we can talk about. The spatial frame, do we include Basra, do we include? Yes, I think we can include as much as we can. I always think to collect as much as you can, and then you can filter, you can organize it. Legal standards, very important. We don't have clear legal standards, probably, to protect. How do we list buildings? How do we list documents? How do we grade them? Which is more important, the date, the importance, the function, the people? Users are very important. When you protect something, is it still being used? How do we make it easily accessible? How do we make it open source, share, shareable database? The urgency, it's very important, the time span. The sooner we act, the better it is. The sooner we act, the more things we will save, we will protect. So this is very important. I will not be that long. Sustainability is a very important item. I always worked since I did my bachelor degree back in Algiers. I worked on sustainability without knowing that I'm working on sustainability. Only when I went to the UK, because it was the trend there, that I learned that I've been working on sustainability for years or years, but without knowing that. So this is very important. All in all, it will bring us to a holistic view of sustainability. It's social, it's economic, cultural, environmental, political, technological, you name it, it's everything. So how do we do it? And how do we develop it? And how do we plan for it? How do we design it? This is very important. The database is one side of it. It will help. But we have to, to move forward. We have to carry on. We have to identify the known, what we have, but we have to expect the unknown. We have to predict the unknown. This way we can move forward. Uh, we'll conclude. We have four elements in nature. We always worked with it. It's fire and water, earth and air. We can use this in anything we work with, in anything we develop. And this will bring us to the, I won't call it traditional, because I do not consider it traditional. I will open a debate. I always use these two words when defining uh, this between brackets, traditional architecture. I always called it genius and the genius architecture. Thank you. So I would like to now invite them to uh, perhaps sit here and we can start the discussion uh, about, about things we can follow up on. There's a number of very interesting threads here um, to do with focus, uh, partners, um, research, accompanying research projects, uh, and uh, the project is in the proposal stage now, We're, uh, so we can fine tune, and of course once we begin, um, this is a project that can, uh, you know, expand uh, going, going forward. Uh, with our uh, first project with the British Library, uh, we started with a very specific focus on set number of records. But now we've expanded, and we've expanded not just in terms of, of, of the uh, range of uh, records in the British Library, but we've expanded to all archives in the world. I mean, that is, our, expanded our gaze to all archives in the world looking for relevant material. So th this, is, this is a very exciting project because the, 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 everything is interconnected, and th this is a wonderful um, way to look at that interconnectedness uh, in a way that we cannot with more traditional approaches uh, by discipline. So if you could please, uh, our speakers, please uh, uh, join me uh, here on the stage, and then we can start, uh, we can start discussing and identifying. Uh, some of the things uh, I'd like to, to look at is one, um, collections. So if anybody has or knows of uh, relevant material, that could be digitized for the uh, digital archive, the Qatar Digital Archive, let us know. Two, uh, partners who'd be interested in, uh, at, at an institutional level in being involved, Nader named a number of them. Uh, we're making notes. Three, uh, individuals who uh, work in this field, uh, wherever they are. Uh, uh, another would be uh, some themes, research themes that we can look at. So as, as Nader pointed out, we can go beyond uh, culture to look at uh, sustainability, adaptation to the environment, the history of climate change, which leads us to the future of climate change, and about uh, revisiting uh, our 
current practices and perhaps learning lessons from the past about how we can adapt going forward to make a much more sustainable built environment. So you can see the full range and potential of this project is significant and the number of people who can benefit from it could be potentially everybody. <coughs> So we'd like to explore these venues and these things that I've, I've, I've pointed out. So um, I'll act as just a moderator, and uh, then showman will be taking notes. Uh, and uh, so let the fun begin. Um, first, first questions, or points, or comments. My name is Nura Laval Dolmillos. I am senior architect at the Qatar Foundation. I look uh, after the historic structures in education city, um, among other things. Um, just a question, um, are you already in dialogue with Qatar museums about what they have from the, the, um, regarding the historic buildings of, uh, of Qatar? I think they have um, a lot of uh, information in their archives and I have not seen them present in the conference. Oh, well, the dialogue begins here. So this is in the proposal stage. I should clarify, Liver we, this, this um, project has a two-pronged approach. One is the, the global approach, identifying collections outside of Qatar, and that will be led by Liverpool. And then we have a, a, a local team here, which will be assembling, uh, that will uh, reach out to uh, Qatari institutions and, uh, and people, uh, uh, and beginning the dialogue. But here is where we begin to make a no. So we've, we've uh, I've, I've uh, during the course of the conference, spoken with some people from numerous institutions, including Qatar museums. So th this is where the dialogue begins. But uh, just to be clear, the planning uh, and the, the proposal that's being uh, um, processed right now is to identify collections outside of Qatar. Uh, so that the next phase for identifying collections inside of Qatar will begin later on this summer. It's only about existing collections that you're going to take and digitalize, or is it also about um, listing or identifying buildings that could be of uh, historic importance? Or oh no, you're right. Well, we can also include the documentation uh, of existing buildings that haven't been documented yet. Yet, so so the remit can be quite uh, extensive. Yes. But uh, please uh, make sure that you give us your contacts so that we can stay in touch and continue that, that dialogue. The project for uh, identifying and working with uh, um, people and institutions in Qatar, that project proposal has yet to begin. Uh, so that will follow on after the Liverpool uh, proposal is finalized and then funded and starts. Then we'll start with the uh, local, local team here. Can I make uh, an observation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I read an interesting uh, article in the New York Times this morning, perhaps some of you may have read. I, I read an interesting article in the New York Times this morning. It, it's a metaphor. Uh, it says that in America, there are fewer women in public office than main men named John. In America, 3.5%, if I remember, percent of men are named John. But American population is 50 some percent women. So how is it that there are less women involved in decision making than John. That really is to bring us here, and that's what I wanted to say, that you, my dear Samia, and Nadia, and yourself, Rajya, you belong here, we belong there. I wish that we had then more women in the core group, James, so that we could be really representative of what it is that we're researching. Absolutely. Yes. That's not. Uh, it is. It is because simply because of 
the strength that we could gather. And I think uh, that's a testament to a uh, number of people working together there and gaining the skills and gaining the expertise. With. So we have an entirely female team um, with uh, small male representation, I think. But uh, uh, it is a really excellent, uh, solid team you know, of people. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, I, th I think uh, we will be the opposite percentage in other because we have 100% <laughs> female student population. And I'm sure they, uh, the two ladies are here, they, they did the video last night. The video you saw, I think Maha and Rada are here. So they are part of the team. And so with 140 plus 160 more or less female students, I'm sure we will uh, inverse the percentage, so <laughs> there won't be John in here anymore. So. <laughs> we have more lady architects than Johns. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're now the hands are going up, so we're beginning a nice, healthy queue. Uh, so first in the queue is Samia. I'll go back to your request. Uh, archives, partners, individuals, themes. So in terms of archives, I think that there is so many archives that one can tap into. And um, um, I can easily send you lists of families in UAE that will be very critical. So I'll do that separately. Thank you. Um, list of partners, three come to mind on top of my list of partners. Ikram has a regional center in Sharjah. Zaki Aslan is the director over there. Uh, Bahrain has the World Heritage Center, and Dr. Shadia Tokan is the um, uh, person there. And you already know Anna Paolini, who's uh, doing the World Heritage. So there's so many World Heritage Centers cropping like mushrooms in the region uh, for all the right reasons. And I think that engaging them is very important for all the wrong reasons. I think that UNESCO is looking for state parties with money. Being absolutely candid here. Mm -hmm. And we need to start teaching them lessons. We need to really get our money's worth. And I'm saying our as if it's my money, but I'll say it. We need to really get our money's worth. Let them not define authenticity for us. Let us be authentic and give them some authenticity. So what I'm calling for is a decolonization of the mind. That's partners, uh, institutional. Uh, individuals, there's a lot of individuals around as well. And uh, thank you, Professor Ardalan, for raising the gender issue. Um, Themes, building capacity. And it was really, I really enjoyed Dr. Ali Rauf's presentation. Really enjoyed it, laughed my head off. I've been in America for the last four years. The issue of fake news is no laughing matter. The issue of fake news is no laughing matter. How will the digital forum address that. You will get a lot of information. How do we build the capacity to filter the information, not from the Qatar National Library, but for all Qataris and all Khalijis to be able to decipher the true from the untrue. And I think that Ibn Khuldun put it very well. History needs the yardstick of philosophy. Building capacity is the most important thing. Not just, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? The, the science itself is a philosophy, right? Science itself is a philosophy. Science tries to be very neutral, and it fails. We see graphs all over research these days. 
But how you manipulate data can be very scientific. Building the capacity to filter information is very, very important. Thanks, Samia. I think next we have is Rob. Rob, did you have a question? No, no. Oh, I, I somebody. An observation. Okay. Catnaps. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I've communicated talk to John with him. Uh, he, yes, we have, but he, he didn't want to be in directly involved, I guess. I don't quite know why, but he was happy to help, and he gave a lot of suggestions for uh, former members of uh, the government who were involved in, uh, in, in, in heritage preservation in the 60s and 70s. Uh, sure. uh, and, and so we haven't reached out to them yet because we don't have a, a capacity locally here yet to do it at the library. Right, okay. <laughs> Generally speaking, I think to be able to bring these archives together and um, uh, preserve them and make them accessible in the future is, is, is the best idea that you know, mm -hmm. anybody's had in a long time when it comes to uh, doing something with Kateri architecture, mm -hmm. both that which is gone and, and the stuff that still survives. Um, it, I think it is a very big challenge, um, especially right from the beginning with establishing the data standards and uh, the different degrees of metadata and things that you need for it. So mm. I, mean, I, I wish you luck. Um, but of course, if you have the, the willpower and the goodwill from people like us and people who may own, people who may own archives, mm -hmm. uh, and the ability and the funding to to work out how to do it, then this is absolutely the perfect place to do it. So uh, I have very positive feelings about this project. Um, if I think of any particular archives or come across any, then of course I'll let you know. But um, there's all the, always the Salam archive, um, the, the, uh, the, the Salam Center um, mm -hmm. guy. The, um, I can't remember the, the, his full name, the photographer who was here from the 50s. Um, he's got an archive of thousands. Abu Isa. Abu Isa, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prefer to document things here. That's right. And they, ah. they, they, they do make things available. Now, he wasn't specifically photographing architecture. He's mainly photographing people but, and events. But in the background of photographs of people, you get buildings. Um, now, I think it would be years of work for someone to go in and catalogue everything they've got. They might have done it already. I don't know. Mm. Um, that's the only other archive I can think of, which is, might be very major. Um, That's good to know. Thank you. Salim? Hey, um, my name is Salim from Qatar University. Um, sorry, I couldn't attend most of this uh, event, beautiful one, which is part of my, my heart. Usually, uh, I start jump up when I, I heard about traditions and anything related to it. I try to... Uh, look at uh, what we're really trying to uh, answer in this uh, uh, conference. I found uh, there is a number, three questions, many questions. The first one was, what it is tradition? Second one, where it is came from? The third one, how to preserve it? And the fourth one, I may add one here, the functionality of the building itself, whether in terms of uh, climate, in terms of uh, 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 technology in terms of culture. But this is what everything has been said uh, about these four questions and very well done and very well really um, stated. I, I have one point, it's not really mentioned at all. We, we, those are related to identity more, more or less. But uh, what about the sense of the place itself? Um, as I say, uh, a place to be successful, you have to be attached to it. And to attach to it, that came from daily experience. Feeling the place in the morning, in the evening, in the summer, in the, in the winter. And the only way to discover the sense of the place is to, to observe people, how they do things inside it. I work in Oman actually for six years. And I used to take students to forts, like Nezwa Fort, for example. And a number of the students, male, females, let them go there, observing what they do when they get inside 
the, the, the citadel or the fort. And I gather them to, and tell them, you know, where did you locate it yourself within this place? Why you stand there, why didn't stand the other place? And when you wanted to talk to your friend, why you moved to that corner? And why you wanted to really spend more time here and ask you to come, you didn't come? You really found yourself more enjoying this moment in that corner of that place? So this kind of question I was asking, asking the question students. And as I, uh, I asked them right away to write down their feeling of the place. So you just got this place for the first time. Here we have the feeling clear in your mind and every part of you. So when you enter any place, you have to remember you have all this sense part of you as a human. I wrote a, a paper actually called Head, Head Turning Situation about Damascus. It's very one, very interesting one. This paper trying to look at how people really perceive the place visually and how they feel it, how they touch it, and how they hear everything around them. Mm. And what makes you, when you walk in the place, look right, not left. We wanted to keep looking at the one point and forget other points around you, mm -hmm. and so on. And when you feel you wanted to leave the place, when you wanted to stay in the place, all this decision came of every, every steps you, you do inside the place. See, architecture is so beautiful. I will refer to one uh, saying by Mahmoud uh, Al-Aqqad, Al-Katib, Taban, and Maruf. He says, to read three books, to read one book, good book, three, three times, it's much better than reading three books one time. I, I, I look at his thought, what he mean by that one? That's mean, when you read the first one, it's a good book, you read it the first time, but you didn't catch everything about it. So you have to read the second time, you catch more, and so on. Architecture is like this, it's a book. Once you go there, don't say, you know, oh, I understand architecture. I look at the picture, I understand the architecture. You're lying to ourselves. We, we do not have any clue what is traditional architecture. The thickness of the wall is one of it. The uniqueness of its features is one another aspect. Uh, the, feel, the feeling of it is another aspect. And so, so on. We can go on to many things. Uh, I had another uh, paper I didn't really publish this one. It's very interesting because I worked like 10 years in, in Damascus also. I look at, since I'm an architect, I learn from architecture school how things have to be. And I found there there is something we are not allowed to do because we consider it wrong. But it is there. And we enjoy it when we see it. So I call it uniqueness of Islamic architecture. I recorded my experience from there. The wall is became the steps when you can move through the wall. You don't see that. And you can see the fair escape when there is a room hidden inside for some reason. And so on. I can talk about it like a, a lot. This part of beautiful Qatari architecture, I haven't seen it in any reference so far. And it's going to be there. It's going to be really considered. And who is going to do it? It's my question, actually. Hmm. And I say that probably because my background and my study is related to Damascus in specific, with all its aspects. I spent years working on it. And I can, since I got the lesson from that region, from Syria, I can now feel it here too. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Salim. Um, can I just say that um, we're very um, keen to uh, record the, the perceptual and the haptic qualities and what you might broadly also categorize under a phenomenological um, um, quality of uh, space. And surely that will come out potentially as one of the themes, you know, of uh, uh, once we have seen the material and we have, and, and also as Noor was pointing out and asking the question that whether um, there is a need for further documentation. Now clearly documentation does not mean just documenting uh, the basic dimensions of a building or the construction systems. It's, a, it's about the whole range of things that Nadir has kindly reminded us and, and that includes um, certainly the, the perceptual qualities, the haptic uh, qual qualities as well as uh, the wider phenomenological issues. So we will keep that in mind absolutely as part of the research of course.
Thanks. Uh, next to the queue, we have uh, Christoph. Then we have Haytham. No. Um, it works. Okay. So, first of all, I yes, I want to uh, point out the needs for such a study and the interest of the and the potential of such a study. Uh, I and associated with these comments. I would like to uh, point the, the need also to focus the study in the future. I mean, basically, uh, we talk about traditional Gulf architecture, and these are very specific words. Traditional, uh, when does it start, when does it stop? We were saying that it comes from very old times, but at the same time, we have to dis define when, it's, when it, when it uh, stops in the modern times. Do we stop it? In, and it differs from one place to another. This timing issue is important because it relates also to the next step of the study, which relates, which which wants to build a bridge between these tradition, traditional features, and what can be implemented in the definition within the definition of a new Gulf architecture that is more related to sustainable issues, to the climate, and all and so forth. Uh, I think this is very important to define the topic from the traditional point of view, when do we stop it? Is it 1930s? Is it industrialization times? Is it, and then it brings uh, more strength to the, to, the, to, the, to the study. The second thing is, of course, the Gulf uh, point. It's, and it relates to the geography. And I, th I believe that each country around the Gulf should tr think about uh, the influence of the Gulf architecture. When does, uh, what does it relate to? I mean, obviously, Qatar is completely within uh, a Gulf architecture. The whole Qatar stands in the Gulf. But it's not the case for Saudi Arabia. It's not the case for Iran. And all these countries will have to dwell upon the thing. It will be interesting to think about the map that relates to this uh, definition of the Gulf architecture. And, uh, one, and this should be happening at the beginning of the studies. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I believe that the study can go uh, for years and, and, and drown, because it's too big. If it's too big, it, it loses sense. Um, the third point I want to, well, it's actually the second point, uh, is to the importance of the building arts, associated building arts. Uh, and the techniques and the know-how that is related to this traditional architecture. I don't know, I, I, my feeling is that, I'm, my experience in other places is that they're very often not very well recorded. Uh, they, are, they, have, they are basic ideas, as was mentioned before, about how to build the lime rendering, how do they do uh, the motors, but they, there is a basic knowledge about what materials are used, and in the best cases, sometimes you have proportions, but you rarely have, very seldomly have, the actual process. And sometimes the process makes a big difference between one place to another. And especially in this area, where uh, the climate was an issue uh, since the very origin of the architectures, uh, the way the masons used to build these houses, the forts and so on, was definitely different from the next uh, area. I mean, it's. Every place is very singular in this way, and the tools and the practices and the steps and the period when they are doing the buildings and uh, how many people are there to do it. And this recording might not exist, but it would be of great interest to the topic, I believe, to actually set up a, a recording process, use this study to uh, build this knowledge before all the malams and all the, the building arts are actually disappearing, because this is what happens. I mean, we still... We're dealing usually in all around the world with the last generation of the traditional builders, and in many places they are dying off. And once their direct, these direct witnesses are dead, there will be no more traces of the traditional uh, building arts. I think this study is worth uh, taking into consideration as part of the of the overall hmm. project. I don't. Know, and one last point, and then I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry to be long. Uh, the last point would be uh, uh, my feeling that this project uh, also has value if it is uh, defined with this, its connection, as I mentioned, to the modern architecture and uh, bringing in uh, spatial, technical, material-related <laughs> solutions for uh, the new architecture that is more, that are more connected with the traditional, uh, the, to the climate and to the sustainable deeds and uh, also the social needs. I mean, bringing back, as we mentioned many times, 
the courtyard, the spaces, the common spaces, the shade, uh, all these issues, um, the connection between the people and the social life. And well, that's it, basically. I make it short. Thank you very much, oh, Christophe. Yes. What you? Oh, sorry. This is one about the partnership. Uh, this. Um, Scientific Committee for Vernacular Architecture at ICOMOS is a, one of the good partners to, to, deal, to deal with as well, yes. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, what you've mentioned reminds me, I'll, I'll let uh, Shoman uh, uh, speak in a second, but just before this thought flees from my, my temporary memory. Um, and perhaps someone in the audience, hopefully, I suspect Samia can tell me this, that um, a GCC city, uh, in its efforts to uh, reconstruct a heritage district, brought in craftsmen from Pakistan and Balochistan, where these skills are still used, uh, in order to, uh, as authentically as possible, uh, uh, reconstruct these buildings, but also record how they were built and the materials used and why they were used in the processes and so on. Um, does this ring a bell to you? This is a long time ago. Right. Who, who was this? Who did that? Uh, Dr. Sabah Jassim, Director of Archaeology oh, Department. Do we have the microphone? So can you yeah, say that Dr. Again? Sabah Jassim, um, the director of the Department of Archaeology in Sharjah, uh -huh. and the team came from It wasn't a necessarily uh -huh. a skilled team, right. but they were aware of the building traditions from their villagers, elders, and um, the art of stone cutting and all of that. Right. And it was a re and it's still it's it's a very important archaeological site. It's one of those burial tombs that mm -hmm. back in date back to 2000 BC, mm -hmm. and it was completely reconstructed. And uh, it cannot be put on the, what do you call it, World Heritage Site, because it's completely reconstructed. Right. And uh, again, I take us back to Ise Shrine is on the World Heritage uh, ah. Site, and it's reconstructed every 22 years. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, if Japan can develop a Nara Charter, mm -hmm. so can we. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So this is something uh, we can investigate. If you could uh, put that in an email, those details for Shoman and uh, me, that would be great. Okay. I will add in this. Uh, this is very important techniques of construction. And I joined the perennial uh, terminology. You know, there are, there are certain things, manners. It's, it's like eating, breathing, constructing. It's the same building. It goes from generation to generation. You mentioned the word ma'allam. You know, I, we did research when I was back in Liverpool. We worked on bathhouses. We went to Morocco. Uh, there are some countries which are good in keeping certain traditions. Morocco is one of them. And we found a technique of tab tablet, tablat, they call it there, and tedlect. And it's even being used here in Qatar. I've noticed it in the new luxurious hotels in Sukhwaqif. So, and we did record with the traditional materials, and I have recordings. Some certain techniques were global at that time. We can uh, record in certain parts of the world, and we will notice that this technique existed probably in the Gulf. Probably, we just have to trace back. If it does not exist, we can look at the origin of the origin. I like that saying of Louis Kahn and. Uh, Professor Nader reminded me of it. We can always trace back, and we will find people here in Qatar, in Kuwait, in Iran, who are still building using the same techniques, probably different materials. But we can trace back those things. Thanks. <coughs> uh, just a couple of comments, quick ones. Uh, the period, why from 1700 till the 50s, uh, I think we relate history to politics. Uh, the Abbasite period, the Amoyad period, the Louis XIII era of... So, 1700s, the tribes here started uniting. 
And I think the idea of going back to Mesopotamia and all the way to the future is good, but I think there is a lot to document within the set period and focus on it. And once you fill your basket with that, then we can go beyond, which is very important to go beyond because a lot of things that happened bef before the 1700 made us what we are. And as far as the reconstructing and documenting the methodology, I know of two guys in our region, from our region, that are masters in it, that go beyond how to lay the stones and the mud and the beams, but know about the proportion. I don't know if you've seen Muhammad Ali speaking yesterday, because he has rebuilt complete towns, and he talks about the proportions, the ratios, and Rashad Bukhash in Dubai, who rebuilt the whole Bastagia era. Yes. Thank you. Uh, before we get on to Haytham, uh, uh, one point that I wanted to, to address was, uh, uh, in addition to these other points I gave at the beginning, was focus. Uh, and, uh, and the question of the use of the word traditional. So this is at the proposal stage. We use the word traditional, thinking that might be adequate. But a number of the papers have pointed out that, you know, that, that actually tends to put um, too much of a restriction on things because, for example, um, that traditional would tend to think more in an exclusive way and to neglect things that are from somewhere else. And the word heritage might be more inclusive and, and, a, and, a, and a porous term. So potentially, what do you think of uh, golf uh, architectural heritage? as a possible label. Because then you can go up to um, you know, more recent history and take a look at how the GCC states were part of a larger architectural discourse in the post-war era, um, looking at some of these uh, fantastic architectural uh, creations from the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, being built by famous architects who were building similar things all over the world. Uh, and yet, that architectural um, phase has been, I guess, documented and cherished and is preserved in the rest of the world. But here, it's being torn down because it's not, you know, traditional or not uh, considered part of the national heritage. Um, so, if we use the word heritage, then we can see how um, um, in a, you know, we, we can include an important phase in the history of these states that otherwise might be uh, neglected or, or overlooked. So um, what, what do you think? Yeah, that, is, that is, I think, has really, um, a good possibility. We need to also think. We need to also think that does that, uh, and this is a discussion that we should probably be having is, if we're saying from the na landscape scale, which is where the human intervention first starts to the point of making architecture and making furniture and so on, mm. there is this kind of whole continuum, you know, that um, which I think we can cover. It's not as difficult as covering going back to 2500 BC, but certainly the interventions within um, uh, the landscape scale, like the large systems that uh, we have uh, heard about and you know the very <coughs> other things, mm -hmm. down to settlements, down to architecture. Now, I think we need to find out an, perhaps an inclusive uh, uh, term to describe that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And maybe a bit of, yes, uh, maybe a bit of thought can be devoted to that you know, now at this stage, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. There, uh, and, and further point on this, there was also a discussion uh, early on that uh, uh, we had with, with Nader, which is why don't we use the word built environment? And uh, while that is certainly the goal and the intention, I thought that this is a, a, a term that is unfamiliar to the general public and would be lost on them and therefore would be self-defeating. It would limit the project to just people who know what built environment means, which is to limit the project substantially. Architecture is something that everyone can relate to, but architecture would not be the end point, it would be the beginning. And we would look at how the architecture is used in all related aspects, including... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Mm. There is a very simple classification, which I just remembered, and I'm sure you all are aware. We can rank it as cultural heritage within this. We can have two divisions, tangible and intangible. Tangible would refer to the built, the intangible non-built. And yeah. we can start the database or the project. That's my opinion. I might be wrong. But this can give us a clear definition on how we would divide it. Mm -hmm. but you would want something that would make sense once you translate in Arabic, because otherwise it's going to get so technical and the response of the mm -hmm. public right. is going to be... Torah this thaqaf, will no? attract, even though it's debatable, I don't mm -hmm. know, vernacular would make sense. Mm -hmm. but, uh, to get into something more sophisticated technically, mm -hmm. to translate this into Arabic, yeah. it will, they wouldn't know what you're after. Mm. Now you want to attract a lot of people with libraries to, to share. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit critical, I think, mm -hmm. the naming. It's worth mm -hmm. putting a, a couple of dozen names in the basket. And yeah, so, th so this is something we need to um, uh, consider more, ponder more, look at. Certainly the word heritage has a, yeah. as a buzzword, uh, ticks all the right boxes. Uh, so it has an additional benefit. Uh, which means that anything with the word heritage on it uh, has positive associations and usually can attract yeah. funding. Yeah. Um, if I can give you one example, if you take a look at the uh, QNRF's major research fund, the NPRP, um, the one thing that they will fund under the category of humanities is anything related to heritage. Uh, but heritage is a wonderful umbrella term because you can fit so much under it. It's not a discipline. Right? It, it encompasses multitude of disciplines. Uh, there's no end to it. It's, so it's nice. It's more liberating. Uh, whereas uh, traditional, although you, you, utilitarian, that can also restrict. So, but this is something we need to discuss and look at in, in more detail and, and think of something because we're still in the proposal stage. Nader? Well, we're, we're going to be slowly closing up our discussion. And I ask for your patience with me. Um, we're gathering information because in time, we wish to help to build a better human environment in our cities and in our architecture. Some Serious research toward that aim says that there are about six areas of attention that should be made. I will just share with you a uh, group thinking of a research group to which I belong for your consideration. In order to develop in time, not only archives, but then probably in time, theories and visions and guidelines for how to build, you know, uh, more durable, more sustainable, more pleasing, uh, more visionary environments. Uh, one is this word that you have used there, uh, cultural heritage. That is, in that vision, in that theory, we should address cultural heritage heritage, which is a certain level of consciousness. This consciousness deals with also a broader category called world view. It would be wonderful if we could also accumulate what have been world views in history in the Gulf about life, about ultimate reality, because you build your world views. An architect, a society builds what is its world view? The second, I think, is very important for a wholesome environment is social equity. It would be very important if we also collect information about our traditions and heritage about social equity, inclusion. The third is economic vitality. We have been recently most involved with using the word economic growth, economic development. That is not necessarily the theme 
of vitality that has always existed in our societies. That is a part of that world view. It's very important. I mean, when I talk about economic vitality, it is, it is barter, it is trade. I trade ore from Dilman for uh, dates from Bahrain. It's, it's how you, you trade the resources of life much deeper, much more organic than economic development. That is a certain level of thought that leads to bigger is better. This is not necessarily a mode of thought that is conducive to this, what I would say, this sublime also aim of what we hope to gain. The other one is, of course, environmental adaptation. I hope that we gather information about how we have adapted to the environment, which you mentioned. The other is this business that you just spoke about, Fadel and others, and, uh, and Ibrahim, how we deal with materiality and the systems of materiality. They go from infrastructure, water systems, drainage systems, you know, all the tr movement systems, to building systems. I hope that we do gather the category of integrated systems. And f I would say finally to the point that this wonderful gentleman brought about, which is participatory design decision making, participatory decision making. It's actually deeper than governance and policy. It's how does a community make decisions about life that is more representative, and how have we done it in the past? How can we learn from that to build societies that feel they're participating in their life and in the form of their life? I think some of these categories, if we could also consider, as we gather all the information, I believe these are some categories that can lead toward a series of design guidelines. Because in time, out of this, somebody, whether it's the government or it's a municipality uh, or it's a client and working with an architect or it will be making decisions. Decisions are all based on a series of guidelines. If we could help nurture some of these guidelines in the work that we do, I think we would also gather very valuable information in what I would hope in time we would create is a series of transcendent design guidelines for human habitat. Thank you, Nader. Uh, Haytham, sorry, you, you've been patient. We kind of got sidetracked uh, on uh, a point that uh, Christoph raised, and now we're back to, to our queue again, so you're, you're up. Regarding this project, um, like I see it like it's going to uh, Establish a large networking structure to all the resources that we can find, mm -hmm. and every resource will guide us or become a reference point for other resources that we don't know about. So we're dealing with many disciplines, which all contribute in shaping the architecture and the human civilization in the GCC. So the amount of material that we would, could find in any source that we don't know about and what's the size of it does not necessarily refer to a specific period of time. It could be from many eras. So um, doesn't have to be limited in our discussion now that we have to specify it, because the shaping of the human civilization goes way, way back than we can imagine. So I think that we should also think about um, phasing the work at some point, because this uh, gradual structuring of the network will become natural. We cannot control it because we, we will find interesting things, unexpected material that needs to be <coughs> prioritized at some point mm. to deal with. And um, that will guide us even away from the GCC up to, say, we can reach the shores of East Africa mm -hmm. to one of their largest libraries that no one knows about, mm -hmm. basement levels of three, four floors that I've heard of, yeah. is waiting to be digitized. And they yeah. have a lot of material about... Something that will contribute in our understanding about how 
ideally architecture shaped in this area as well. So all, all what I'm trying to say is that um, specifying the period from now may not apply on the findings we get afterwards. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It may, you know, surprise us what we will be finding about some we cannot also specify um, a specific discipline. We can be dealing with people who collected material on calligraphy or, you know, collected material on simply just the craft of carpentry that happened. So mm -hmm. that all eventually will contribute in shaping up what we see today and what we have discussed. And this conference is an example of bringing these people together who have already an idea about some networks that they know, that can, they can bring partnership, they can bring material. And I've, maybe I've mentioned this with Shoman that um, they become reference point, like scholar, no other scholars who have similar material or even more sitting on it, which has not been published. Mm -hmm. um, private collectors, no other private collectors as well. So all that builds up gradually, and we have to now think about then how do we deal with it at that moment. That's only my point. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly one of the organizing principles um, is uh, yeah, we're looking at the Gulf as a cultural zone. And although the, 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 the region has uh, had um, at least five different indigenous communities with their own languages and so on, the dominant community, of course, have been the Gulf Arabs. And the project seeks to tell at, uh, at its core a, a new aspect of the history of the Gulf Arabs. Now, the Gulf Arabs, of course, one of the key features about their story is that they love to get on boats and go around. And so the Gulf, the, the, if, you t if you were to map the world of the Gulf Arabs, it will take you well beyond the Gulf to Africa and, um, and to India and Pakistan. And that explains why on, uh, when you look at a traditional house of a, of a, of a pearl merchant from, from, uh, from Doha or Manama, the beautiful carved door will not be from the Gulf itself. It came from Africa or India, carved by craftsmen there, from, with wood from there. Um, and if we take a look at other aspects of the material culture of, of the region, we see, in fact, when you look at it, that it is that, that embedded in it is the story of the Gulf Arabs. Look at the Arab chest. All right. it, 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 I think it's a, s a symbol, a wonderful symbol of the story of the Gulf Arabs. Now, the Arab chest, we believe, originates from the Portuguese era. It's, it's, it's a local adaptation of the Portuguese seaman's chest. Now, the Arab chest, of course, there's the Kuwaiti chest, there's the Bahraini chest, there's the Omani chest, but the chests were not made in the Gulf. They were made in India by Indian craftsmen. The adjective applied not to the manufacturer, but to the owner. So when the Kuwaiti chest was shipped out to Kuwait, then um, it had a, sort of an Indian design, on, and, and onto that was added another layer. So then the, the owner would stamp his own uh, imprint on it and make it distinctly Kuwaiti, different patterns and things like this. So what you have is a story of economic uh, ties and, 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 and the story of the world's connection with this part of the region. So you can go beyond the physical structure of the chest to tell a much larger and more interesting story uh, about the story of, of Kuwait's, in this case, uh, connection with the wider world. And so we can with architecture, and, and, and that, that's the wonderful thing about this project is it, it opens the door to this. We have to be careful in terms of focus when it comes to the specifics and deliverables and what gets digitized and things like that. Yes, that's, but the, the, the Gulf region itself, in, in, for any historian, any uh, uh, academic studying the region, you know, be it anthropology, society, history, economics, the built environment, will encounter this. Um, I mean, for example, uh, look at headdress. I mean, these things have been adopted as part of national dress, but in a number of cases, the headdress isn't from the nation that the headdress represents. It is from somewhere else, like Kashmir. Um, <clears throat> so when we begin to deconstruct, we learn a lot about ourselves or about the countries that we're looking at, and, and that's what's really interesting. Um, so anyway, that's my two cents worth. <laughs> Thanks, James. Uh, I hate them just to... 
I think any database, based on my experience, are designed quite few, should be the most important quality. It has to be flexible. Flexible to expand, flexible to be resized. And I always see it as a tree. So today we are planting the seeds, and this tree we will... Sorry. Uh, today we are planting the seeds, and this tree will grow after. So for how big, how far it will expand, I think we should not put limits. The only thing, we have to have core elements, which we should start with. And, and I think the basis is almost there. So. Ashwaman, would you like to... Uh, just now at our end time, so would you like okay. to say some final concluding remarks? Well, before, yes, just I've got a couple of very practical questions, and they, these relate to what has already been talked about and alluded to. One is information from various individuals, and how might we structure that uh, information gathering. And the other one which uh, I think for the Gulf region has been an incredibly important thing, that is various consultants from all over the world have been building this part of the, the, the world uh, um, in collaboration in different ways with uh, locals. And there is a huge wealth of material that lies with various consultants who have, and has been uh, already indicated that uh, the, the, the Iraqi consultants, for example, Mohamed Makia, I know there's so much material on his, his work in, in various parts of the Gulf region, but there are many, many, many more. There are also Polish uh, and uh, erstwhile USSR-related uh, uh, consultants working here, and they have actually contributed significantly to urban development buildings and so on. How uh, I would like to just very quickly perhaps um, understand what your views are on how we might be able to collect that kind of material uh, from consultants and various other consultants of a range, a wide range, not only just constructing buildings but various other things, as well as uh, the collection of material from individuals, um, both um, who are uh, locals but also expatriates who have resided here for many, many, many years and probably are as much a Gulf uh, national as anyone else, for that matter. Mm. Well, I'm looking at the time, and we're now uh, at the end point. I know we could carry on for much longer, so what I would like to do instead is to offer you the opportunity to continue the discussion over lunch. We have now an hour-long lunch break, followed by at 1.30, if you're interested. Uh, please join uh, the delegates and me uh, on a tour of some um, uh, traditional, if I can use that word, architecture. Um, <laughs> uh, two palaces that you might have seen over by Gate 5 here at Education City, which are owned by the government. And we've managed to, uh, through the dedicated uh, persistence of, of uh, a member of our uh, conference team, Haya, we have gotten permission to get access to uh, and one of them, I think, was owned by a former emir of Qatar. So uh, if you would like to join us, we'll be going there. If you have your own car, you can follow in our buses. The buses will be meeting outside at the uh, Welcome to QNL uh, sign, the big brown sign out front. Just follow us. It's a, it's a five, ten minute drive from here, and then we'll take a look. An hour after that, then we're going to carry on to Wakra. So if you would like to uh, join us over lunch, we can continue the discussion, certainly exchange business cards, uh, and to follow up on all these points and others that you've raised in emails to me and to the rest of the team, to Showman in particular, who will be heading up the, the project. Uh, and all that remains for me to say now is, um, would you please join me in thanking our uh, panelists? And may I thank you. Uh, and may the panelists thank the audience uh, for, uh, I think, what has been a fantastic week, architecture week, looking at this really fascinating yet understudied and important subjects. Thank you very much.